This is, this is, uh, I don't know, dear audience, this is an evergreen discussion. You might be watching this in years, but in the last couple of days, the, the, the discussion has started to percolate up again because there is a supposedly in a few months time going to be a great debate on the Joe Rogan experience between our very own Flint Dibble, uh, our very own Flint Dibble, uh, archaeologist extraordinaire and, uh, and, uh, 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 you know, who I consider a a friend and acquaintance, uh, and, 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 uh, and Graham. Our what very own um, Flint Dimble. Uh... Hello, and welcome to this very special watching brief interview. The only archaeological show in town for the last couple of weeks has probably been the debate between Graham Hancock, pseudo archaeologist Graham Hancock, um, and our guest, Dr. Flint Dibble on the Joe Rogan experience. Um, welcome to the Watching Brief, uh, Flint. And uh, as, uh, as I said in, in, in our prep for this, what we wanted to do really was to explore the importance of the debate you, that you had with Graham Hancock over four and a half hours, if people want to look at it. Um, it's now had several million hits. Um, it is, it, you know, it's, it's a, I think we could say it's a significant cultural phenomenon, certainly in, in our sector, in the archaeology and heritage sector, uh, and probably certainly in the English speaking uh, part of the uh, of the universe. Um, and so I think that there are there is a lot to explore here with you. And I, I need to begin really by making an apology, because <laughs> long before we set up this interview and long before it, it happened, um, I went on the record with my good colleague, Mr. Bartman Astles, who sat to, behind the technology here on, on the watching brief. And I said that I didn't think the debate that you'd offered Graham Hancock would ever happen. And the reason I said that was in purely media terms, in purely PR terms, I didn't see what Graham Hancock had to gain from it because so far as I could see, all there was was a downside because if, he was held to account on the various theories, various aspects of the theory that he espouses for the, you know, the, the um, worldwide intellectually and technically advanced civilization um, in the, during the most recent ice age. Um, all, all there was, was a downside for him. So why, why engage when he's got his, he's got his audience, he's got his books, he's got his sales, he's got his TV documentary on Netflix, which kicked all this off. So why do you think he actually took up the invitation in the end? Oh, that's a tough question. It's tough for me to get inside Graham Hancock's head, of course. Um, I, I don't know. I think some of it is how he, his persona that he portrays, he, he portrays himself almost as if he is an academic. Um, I mean, he isn't, he never actually says that he is, but he comes off in that way. And so I think he was excited for the opportunity to engage with an actual scholar. Um, and an actual archaeologist. And he has done this several times in the past. Um, he actually started off the the conversation on Joe Rogan with a, a fib. He said that he'd never actually done this in the past. The only time he tried to do it was with Zahi Awas, who stormed off the stage famously in 2014. But he'd actually sat down, according to the research I've done, two other times with Zahi Awas and did two full-length conversations, including one on a cruise ship off the coast of Alaska, which was broadcast on radio live um, back in the late 1990s. And so he relishes, I think, engaging with scholars and with academics. He does it all the time. He, he loves to talk about how Klaus Schmidt showed him around Gobekli Tepe for a few days and things like that. And so he, he, he likes to have some sort of communication with archaeology. I think he sees it as uh, some way of legitimizing him. I mean, I tend to think that that's it doesn't do that because his real legitimization comes around from Netflix and from Amazon uh, listing his books and top sellers in archaeology and from Joe Rogan having him on over 10 times. That's what makes him look legitimate in the eyes of the public. Or he goes and gives lectures at UCL. He rents out a room at UCL. And again, it gives that persona a wink. 
of it feeling like it's a, it's a university lecture um, when it's actually not. And so I think that might be part of it is, is the persona he tries to craft as if he is actually mounting a real challenge towards academic scholarship, um, which, as I tried to explain, he's really not in any sort of way. Um, but I think that's the that's what he wants to get across to his audience is that he is mounting a legitimate scholarly challenge when in fact it's really just a netflix show so uh, maybe there's, there's a couple of points in there which maybe we'll come back to later on in this conversation um but in terms of actually setting the uh the debate the conversation call it whatever we're going to um in terms of actually setting that up now obviously there was a, a certain uh time lag between the, the Netflix series, the Society for American Archaeology letter, which is referenced that uh, asks Netflix to reclassify the, the series of science fiction, um, and the, the, the whole debate within the archaeology and heritage sector about how to deal with pseudo-archaeology, given the high profile of the Netflix documentary, um, and, and obviously and, and your involvement, and you, you've been very open about the health issues you've been facing recently, and it's great to see you here you know, working and... Uh, and, and um, very, very much a, a, alive and on camera with us this morning, but um, it's that, a lie. That, that, I'm a simulation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but that that that, that aside, um, how long and, and what what to and fro was there between you and Joe Rogan and Hancock or Hancock's people for one to, uh, uh, whatever um, before the, the 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 actual show was greenlit? Yeah, I mean, so. It only all came together in the last month beforehand, um, where we've all agreed on on how it would uh, take place. Um, but the, there wasn't a ton. It was mainly just on delay due to my health issues. Um, we were originally supposed to do this in October, last October. But since I was dealing with that targeted therapy, the chemotherapy I was on, I was not up for it. Um, I had really nasty fevers and just traveling like that did not seem like something I'd be good for. So that was really the biggest delay. I got off my therapy what uh six weeks ago almost to the date and so it was around that time that we finalized everything and 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 finalized the date and on all that kind of stuff um you know I, it's it's the the timing's also ironic i found out that my my cancer had returned in my lymph nodes literally the day after graham hancock announced this on twitter and so you know it was just very ironic in that sense and so i couldn't reply because i was just you know, uh, devastated by the news, let's say. And uh, in the end, it's okay. I'm I'm fully cancer free and I'm done with the therapy. But uh, it was just, yeah, that that sort of helped define the timeline of it. it was just my health issues, and so uh, that's really most of what complicated it in that sense and delayed it. Yeah, I mean, we now, were originally going to do it in October simply just because we needed a time when both of us could travel to the U.S. Because that's also not so easy to work out. So even then, it was going to be delayed by by several months simply because of you know, I was excavating over the summer. He was doing whatever the heck he was doing. And so, yeah, that was the time we'd sort of agreed on it originally. Yeah. Most of what we do here on on, on the watching brief, we do remotely as we're, as we're talking remotely now. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that it's very much a part of the Joe Rogan experience that it is a live studio event. Is that is that right? Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I'm, I've not seen all of Joe Rogan's episodes. I've actually seen only a few, but uh, I think all of them are in person. I don't think, I mean, there might be like a small zoom in type thing. Like if you saw the Michael Shermer, Graham Hancock thing from several years ago, each of them had a friend on call that could zoom in. And uh, uh, me and Graham both showed up with some pre-recorded little comments by colleagues or by other people. Uh, but in general, I think Joe Rogan only does it in person. Yeah. And, uh, an obvious question, a sort of human interest question rather than academic question. But uh, I'm, I'm assuming you hadn't met Graham Hancock before. What was it like to actually meet him in person? Uh, yeah, it was interesting because, you know, obviously I listened to so much of what he said. And I'd heard from other people that had met him in person that he's a very charming, kind individual in, in person. And he came off that way, except when he tried to misrepresent me during the on camera in the conversation. But but behind the camera, he was he was very you know, charming and kind and personable. Um, I mean, so was Joe Rogan. They were, they were, yeah, yeah. No, I, no I complaints think, on that. <laughs> right. And, and in fact, I mean, one of the, um, one of the thoughts I had watching it um, was, and actually uh, I have to admit here, although I'm, I'm a person that likes to think they follow the media and, 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 and trends in, in, in the media and the social media and so on. And, and, and obviously we use, social media formats all the time here again on on, on the watching brief and 
along with many of our colleagues. Um, but I hadn't expected Joe Rogan to come across in the way that he certainly comes across, I think, in the conversation between you and Graham, um, as he did come across as a more or less objective, interested interlocutor and moderator. So he, he wasn't trying, he, he wasn't, given how much of his audience is reputedly in that area of people, that segment of the population that enjoys conspiracy theory and um, anti-science, counter-science, whatever you want to call it. Um, it wasn't what I was expecting. Did, did Were you surprised by that or or, or, or was that how you, you, what you expected from the, from the three discussions you've had? I mean, so, you know, I did as much research as I could to prepare for this. And uh, so obviously I watched a lot of different Joe Rogan episodes. I watched a lot of Graham Hancock and read Graham Hancock. And I, I knew what to expect from uh, Graham to a certain degree because I, I really, you know, tried to nail that down because he talks about a, a set number of things. And I wanted to make sure I was prepared for most of them or and, and to know what I wanted to talk about and what I didn't want to talk about on camera. With Joe, it was more difficult to tell how he would how he would be as a moderator um when he has scientists on uh which he has had several scientists on obviously the majority of people he has on are comedians or or sports figures but uh he does have scientists on as well as the many pseudoscientists he has on and when when he has scientists on whether it's neil degrasse tyson or andy Dessler, who's a climate scientist or peter hotez who's done vaccine research he actually is a very good conversationalist with scientists and he's frequently persuaded by what scientists have to say um, and so that was my hope. And I think it went in that direction. And I'm very grateful that it did. I did not necessarily expect that, though, because he's also had Graham Hancock on, you know, 12 times or something like that. He was a producer and appeared on the Ancient Apocalypse. And so I was very nervous about that uh, relationship uh, getting in the way of me being able to say what I wanted to say. And so I was pleased that it did not. I think Joe started off very strongly in Graham's camp, even at the very introduction. He introduced Graham as, you know, the first real guest on his show and made it clear they were buddy-buddy. Mm -hmm. But as I, A, came in with interesting and entertaining information and a lot of information that really showed that arche what archaeologists do and, and, and the kind of evidence we have, it, it at least seemed to me as if he became more and more persuaded by it as the uh, conversation went on. I also don't think he was very pleased with how uh, Graham was showing like social media posts and stuff like that. I think he preferred more of like a, a highbrow conversation and not this lowbrow stuff that, that Graham was trying to do. And I think that also worked in my favor with Joe because Joe is very sensitive, I think, to free speech and cancel culture and all that kind of stuff. Mm. I don't always agree with his views on that, but I think in this case, it came out in my favor. I mean, it was one of the reasons I, ch I, I, I agreed to do this was because it would be a long form conversation. And because Joe Rogan's team is very famous for not editing down those conversations and clipping it up. So I knew I wouldn't be, you know, clipped out of context heavily. And that was one of my main goals going in, in addition to the precondition that I start, you know, so I could lay down all the evidence right away and define what archaeologists do and things like that. And so I was really glad to see that, you know, Joe, I guess sticks to his guns on, uh, on on being a free thinker and authentic in how he sees things, and he he certainly did that. I think it upset a lot of Graham fans and some of his own fans even to sort of see him siding with me at times over Graham. I don't think he did entirely, but at times, if you see what I mean, and I, I think that that was powerful as well in how how it hit the audience, if you see what I mean. I'll pick up on a uh, couple of uh, things from that in, in a moment, if I may. And, and just for, in, in case anyone's new to this uh, and new to to, uh, to the watching brief, um, I should make it clear we've not made any, uh, we've not discussed any preconditions before we started this conversation. Um, and, <laughs> uh -oh, um, <laughs> uh, no, uh, but also, um, and, and neither do we, uh, we, we, we occasionally um edit if there's a technical issue or something like that but basically what we record we broadcast on 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 the youtube feed so um we're very much in in that kind of uh ballpark where we took it, it's long form conversations where hopefully you know um we, we the subjects that we discuss ha 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 have have room to breathe there's room to look at nuance rather than just go for the bullet points yeah. um ha ha having said that in terms of the um the way you you framed it now you you again you've written in in the articles that the follow-up articles that you wrote for the sapiens and then over the weekend in the observer 
um that um but uh you wanted to go first in the yeah. in the debate uh and 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 that um and, and you you got that um that that request accepted um why did you want to go first well i i think it came down to my reading of how to combat misinformation um, the, a lot of research. So, the, you know, the way that scientists and skeptics and others interested in combating pseudoscience have gone about it over the last few decades has started to shift dramatically in the last 10 years as we've seen the effect of social media on misinformation. And, and, and so, you know, debunking has been has been demonstrated in a lot of different studies to to not be as effective as we'd like. It's not saying that it isn't a worthwhile thing to do. It certainly can be very effective, but at the same time, it's not as effective as some other strategies. And one of the key ones uh, that that I that are two of them, I suppose, that I wrote about is pre-bunking, where you really go in and you 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 arm an audience or people with knowledge, and that knowledge and evidence uh, can help them see through. Uh, the the logical issues and the evidential ish, evidentiary issues with pseudoscientific narratives, and so in that sense, I really wanted to to make sure that I could prebunk and lay out my entire argument in the first fifteen minutes in a very clear fashion with images, so that that would stick in people's brains. They would actually understand before Graham has a chance to explain his narrative what kind of evidence he's up against. You know, I really went for the big data kind of approach um, where I was trying to explain we have millions of sites and billions of artifacts. You know, we have so many shipwrecks everywhere. We do a lot of underwater archaeology. We survey the Sahara. We have 13,000 Paleolithic sites in the, radio, in the Paleolithic radiocarbon database of Europe. And so it's just like it, to wave away all this evidence God, that's not so easy to do, and people need to recognize this. And so that was really what I wanted to start with. And and I tried to, you know, capture their attention with, uh, you know, some scenes of hardcore graphic sex on Athenian pottery that my PhD supervisor had published on to I show was, the uh, way. <laughs> you know, I, I I was about to come to that because yeah. um, certainly. I, it was certainly eye catching, and it was certainly a, <laughs> a, a the, the the export of erotic pottery, uh, attic pottery from uh, from from Athens to northern Italy and the Etruscans was a new one on me. I have to say, and it was a, 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 and fascinating <laughs> it was. Um, but but what, one one quick question on that: you you, you yeah. talked about um, the, having the the, the 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 graphics, the you know the, the 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 PowerPoint that we're all familiar with as when we're giving an archaeological lecture, using archaeological language, if you like, visual language and verbal language. Um, before we started this recording, Mark and I had a long conversation about what a podcast actually is. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and, and obviously, there's no question that Joe Rogan is a podcaster. That's how he defines himself. Um, but podcast began as largely an oral medium yeah. sound medium it's now morphed into this um visual medium not just through joe rogan with the you know millions of hits he gets on on youtube but the bbc does it with things like uh, the, the the political podcast that it runs and so on the um global with their with, with their podcast like news agents and so on um so we're now used to trying to come up with um a language that works in both mm -hmm. so how successful do you think it is was what compromises did you have to make when you're showing a fabulous slide of an erotic athenian vase but a large part of the audience can't actually see it yeah well that's why i asked joe to describe it <laughs> that's how i started <laughs> off um, but yeah, I mean, that's look, archaeology, so much of our evidence is visual. And so I, I wanted to make sure even with that first slide and the description of it, it was meant to be kind of a cue to the audience. Hey, think about watching this um, because there's going to be a lot of visual evidence that's there in front of you. Um, mm -hmm. And to a certain degree, I think it's a lot of it just comes down to explaining things clearly where the slides are supplementary. Uh, supplemental rather than uh, the absolutely necessary, right? And so I think that, that that comes down to how scholars can speak to the public. We need to become confident in, A, 
look, we need to express complicated information in a clear way. That's just life. We can't dumb things down. If we dumb things down, we're going to lose the audience. But at the same time, what we do want to get rid of is as much of the jargon. So that's where some of the practice came into play. Like, so I wouldn't say Pleistocene, but I'd say Ice Age, you know? And so the, trying to make sure that I'm not getting too technical with the language that I'm using. Um, but I still stay at a high level in terms of the evidence that I'm using. And so I think there's always going to be that trade-off, but I, from at least the feedback I've seen, a lot of people that just listened to this and didn't see it really got a lot from it, though I have heard from several people, boy, when you went and watched it rather than listened to it, it made a, it made a big difference to see everything at the same time. And I, I sort of hope that some of that came across because we kept talking about the visuals, the blurry photos that Graham was showing and things like that. And so my hope is that more people at some point tuned in with the, with the visuals because I think seeing is a certain level of believing that I think is important for, for some people. It's a different way of learning and so I, rather than listening. And so I think having both of those there is really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now um, one of the... Um, you, you talk about um, uh, visual and blurry photographs and so on. Um, <laughs> I'll pick out maybe one or two moments that certainly jumped out at, at me when I was watching the, the show. Um, and, and maybe just to explore maybe in a little more depth. And, 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 I, and, and I do say to our audience, do try and give it four and a half hours of your time. Treat it as a mini series if you have to. Um, but it does, there's a lot of nuance, I think, in the course of that running time, uh, which you don't normally, we're not normally used to in mm -hmm. uh, certainly broadcast archaeology debates and, 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 and actually podcasts, which are often time limited uh, to around half an hour or so, or maybe three quarters of an hour or so. Um, but I'll, I'll start, if I may, um, by talking about the discussion that you had about Yonaguni. Mm -hmm. Because it struck me watching it that that was one of the areas where Graham Hancock has made a lot about Yonaguni off the coast of Japan. It's these uh, this these stepped rock structures, for want of a better word, um, that are only accessible as a diver. Now, um, Graham Hancock's uh, argued that the they're, they're, they're stepped, they're right angled, they're they're human constructs, um, and they would have been above sea level during the most recent ice age during the time when his worldwide civilization of navigator priests are, are allegedly active um but you came back at him with the work of the geologist robert shock <laughs> who Hancock's previously quoted in support of his work including and principally in fact um to do with the um alleged uh water effects on the rock that the sphinx is carved from on the giza plateau um but shock has come out and said that actually yonaguni isn't a human construct it's natural the right angles aren't right angles there are no uh tool marks um it's noted that the rock that it's made from it doesn't appear in structures on land nearby and so on and so on and so on. So, uh, how did you find that whole that whole passage of the of, of the discussion? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually thought it was kind of funny because Graham kept trying to bring up ge geological examples, and he he really shied away from going to any of the archaeological sites that he normally goes to. And so that actually kind of shocked me. I'd done more preparation on the archaeology side of things, obviously, and sort of the the answer over whether Yonaguni is man-made or not, it comes down to geologists. I mean, from my perspective, it's a tough thing to express because it just doesn't look like any other archaeological structure out there. It's certainly not a wall. It's certainly not anything. And so, but the only way to really make that point clear is to show photos of a million other walls and other features that are anthropogenic. And so it's not something to get across so easily in a debate, me not being a geologist. And so it, it was, it was, a, difficult to deal with in that sense, and B, also kind of ironic because he really did not want to talk about any actual archaeology, even when he brings up Ganung Padang. He's like, we don't have time for this, about the details of the archaeology. This is like, there's still like three hours of chatting left. And so it's just like, come on, man, why don't you want to talk about archaeology with an archaeologist? If you want to make a claim that this is an archaeological monument, where are the finds? I, don't, I can't think of any single archaeological monument that does not have an artifact associated with it, whether it's underwater or above water. And so, you know, that was the point I kept trying to hammer home is where is 
where's the clear evidence? Where's the tool marks? Where's the finds? This is what we need. And on top of it, yeah, it just doesn't look like any archaeology in the world. It does not match anything, which is how archaeologists go about identifying things. We have other examples that are clear cut, and then we use those to help uh, understand and define what we're looking at typologically or otherwise. Perhaps it comes back to the point you were making earlier about um, Graham Hancock seeking some kind of... Um, not justification, but affirmation, really, by being able to interact with these you know, professional groupings, be they geologists or, or archaeologists. And you just mentioned Gunung Padang. Um, obviously, that's been in the news a lot recently because of the retraction of the Wiley paper in mm -hmm. uh, Geophysical Prospection. Uh, which we've covered here on the Watching Brief. There's a lot of uh, literature out there about it, including a very comprehensive, um, I think, pretty angry um, exposition about it on Graham Hancock's own website. Yeah, um, and, and 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 really that 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 uh, I think plays to the um, discussion you were talking about about free speech and cancellation and so on because the accusation there is certainly that um, air quotes big archaeology is seeking to cancel the work of the geologists at Gunung Padang um, in and 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 Graham Hancock's claims about it or, or reported claims uh, report uh, quoting their work that it's a 15,000 year old anthropogenic human made structure. Um, and it struck me looking at that argument that in a sense, Graham Hancock wins both ways. If he gets an article accepted and retained in a journal of record, he has that affirmation from the archaeological sector. On the other hand, if, as has currently happened, uh, the article's retracted, he can play the big archaeology card. Do you, do, you, do you think there's anything in that, or am I just being conspiracy theory? Uh, conspiracy no, minded? I think you're right. I think this is a common tactic by a lot of people in the media to sort of play things both ways. Whatever happens is a victory for them. It's just about how you spin it. And so, you know, Graham is an expert at, at, at you know, playing a game in the media. And so he's very good at speaking up on his positions. And I mean, you know, it's just so ironic. I mean, his show clips archaeologists out of context. We are being censored in that sense. So what we say gets turned into something else on his show. You know, the article about Gunung Padang, go check out my YouTube channel. I interviewed Luf Professor Lufi Yondri, who did major excavations at the site. That article never even acknowledges all that archaeological work that has been done at the site, nor does season one of Ancient Apocalypse. It's sort of like, how could archaeologists have ignored this in the middle of the jungle? And it's like, archaeologists didn't ignore it. They did major excavations there. They've curated it, cleaned it up brush, curated it, and presented it to the public. And so it's just sort of, you know, that's the narrative he wants to play, but he ignores these Indonesian archaeologists because they don't publish in English. And so it's easy to ignore them. Nobody's going to know about them. And that's why I was pleased when Harry Sofian got me in touch with uh, uh, Dr. Yondri so that I could actually get the real perspective from the real professionals on the excavations that had occurred there and what they actually say, because it was just completely ignored in that paper in archaeological prospection that there were actual scientific excavations with clear radiocarbon dates from underneath the terraces and under the walls that date them. And so it was just not in doubt when that site, what's visible, dates to. And uh, yeah, but he tried to play this game like it's cancellation. And it's like, well, look, this article just ignored all the relevant scholarship. It's not a legitimate scientific article if it's going to do that. And so it's just sort of, I don't know how it got published. I, I didn't do anything in, in favor of it being retracted. That was other people, I suppose. I don't know who. I think Andre Kostopoulos mentioned he wrote to Archaeological Perspection on Twitter. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't really know. It's, I, I, you don't see many archaeology articles retracted. Um, but I think that this one was published in bad faith purposefully eliding the archaeology that was done. And so I have mixed thoughts on it. I can understand the justification for retracting it. It seemed not to be done in, in good faith science, if you see what I mean. And I have to inter uh, in interject there and say that uh, uh, the authors of the paper, I'm sure, would disagree with the view that you just put forward. Oh, um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, it struck me watching it, though, that one of the most emotionally engaged um, disagreements, in effect, 
was the discussion of the impact of Graham Hancock's hypotheses on discussions of colonialism and racism in archaeology and um, folklore and, 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 and so on. Um, now, he, uh, Graham Hancock got very exercised by the any idea that he was uh, enabling racism, let alone he was racist himself. And that's, uh, I guess, understandable. But what, what's your, in, in, in reflecting back on that passage of discussion, what's your, uh, what, what's your take on, on, on that particular aspect of the discussion and where it went? Yeah, I mean, so I expected him to probably do that. I was hopeful he wouldn't because we agreed we'd stay with the evidence and stay respectful. But I think what he did was he, he worked really hard to twist some of my own words out of context. I've never called Graham Hancock a racist, a white supremacist, or a grifter. But what he did was he took these quotes and made it look as if I was saying that about him when I, what I was talking about was the history of some of the ideas he draws upon and some of the evidence he uses to support his arguments throughout Fingerprints of the Gods. He uses these Spanish colonial sources written in Spanish, sometimes by indigenous people, sometimes by Spanish people, um, that, that describe these sort of white deities, these white skinned bearded deities in Mesoamerica and South America. And so I really wanted to point out that, hey, these sources are not are, are not uh, good sources to use. They are grounded in traditional colonialism and uh, white supremacism and racism, and that tinges their arguments. And we can look at these sort of pre-contact uh, forms of evidence for Quetzalcoatl and other figures, and none of them depict or describe white skin. That only comes about after the Spanish come. And so that's one thing I wanted to hammer home on. Another one that I didn't get to go into as much detail on, Joe Rogan probably wisely advised I did not bring up tweets and things like that, is that, you know, some of Graham's fans or other people take this Atlantis narrative in today's world, and they are mo more overtly racist. They are overtly racist, in fact, in the way that they describe uh, indigenous people so I, I saw, I had one tweet, I forget what it says, but it's like, you know, indigenous people squat in the ruins of this white civilization that comes before. And so that's something that you see commonly on the internet or in, and even in books written by some of these uh, more overtly racist people uh, about how this earlier civilization was a white skin civilization and that it was the, responsible for so much of the cultural heritage around the world, except for in Europe. And so it's it's a problem in my mind that that people are doing that, and I think people should be aware. But my goal in that venue was not really to to talk too much about this that topic because it was not the right venue to make that kind of point, if you see what I mean. Um, given that it was filled with Graham's fans, who many some of whom have this idea, or even if they don't have this idea, they take it as if they're being called a racist. When I'm not trying to call everybody a racist who believes in Atlantis, that is not the point. The point is is that there's this history to it and there's this modern misuse of it and to be honest i'm very vocal about the colonial and racist history of archaeology itself mainstream archaeology has a very troubled past and we should be talking about that and we should be working to change how archaeology occurs today that's why there's so many conversations in the media about repatriation and about how to go about doing research in formerly colonized areas how do we do this in an ethical manner and for me, it's almost kind of silly. I work in Greece and I am entirely beholden to the Greek government. And I think that's a good thing. I work closely with Greek colleagues. I work closely with the Greek Ministry of Culture. Uh, sometimes my permits get denied. I went down to Knossos at Crete just a couple months ago and I had everything in my permit in hand or so I thought. And then I could not export the material because uh, something had not been filled out correctly. And so it's just sort of like that is, I think, normal. We should be working with, uh, you know, local heritage, with people today who are the descendant communities. That is how we should be going about this in a respectful um, manner. And so, you know, I, I, I wish that more pseudo-archaeology fans would think about applying that kind of same respect to local and uh, indigenous traditions um, as much as some archaeologists are. I don't want to say all of archaeology is doing a good job at this either. Um, that would be a lie. But, yeah. I, no. No, I, I mean, I, I think you're, you're, you're right in the script, but that, that's, that's an increasingly mainstream point of view in archaeology worldwide, I think. Um, yeah. But, um, but um, I, 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 can I just track back a second to, you talked about um, 
sources and and, and uh, uh, archaeological and uh, historians uh, discussion of sources and particularly modern takes on these old tropes of the you know the the, the blonde haired white skinned bearded that are you know coming to the south america coming to south america central america um pre pre cortez um and one of the things we've discussed many times here on the, on the watching brief and i've certainly picked, picked up on, in, in my own social media feeds and on on, on the uh, pipeline website which i edit um is the way much of archaeology much contemporary archaeological thought and discussion is hidden behind paywalls that are even higher than the journalistic paywalls that some newspaper groups put up. So it is very difficult for somebody out who's not a professional archaeologist uh, with a, with an academic tenure and a login um, to the to the wileys of this world uh, and, and, and the other academic publishers we could name and arguably shame. Um, but a lot of archaeological research is actually literally out of reach of the public and it strikes me that that does have an impact on the kind of discussions we're having around the work of people like Graham Hancock and their impact culturally. And I wonder, do, do you, do you see that as an issue? And if so, how would you solve it? Well, I think it or is an issue. I think it, especially for publicly funded research, it should be publicly available in my mind. Um, and the way that journals charge so much is a real travesty. It keeps uh, information away from the public. But I do want to make clear also that, look, like any other profession or field of science or humanities or social sciences, expertise is still important because there is a lot of publicly available stuff. It's not like there's lots of data sets that are publicly available. There's lots of, you know, your website, other websites that give information away for people to read um, very readily. But there's an overload of information, and it takes a lot of experience to understand how to navigate that overload of information that is available. And so, like, I've seen even just in the last few days, people that have never read a single bit of archaeobotany have gone and found one article, and they're going and criticizing my take on environmental archaeology and archaeobotany and domestication. And it's just like, this is based upon me reading hundreds of articles and dozens of books on this topic. This is not, you know, me doing it in the field. This is not something that you can just go read one article and proclaim to be a, a, an expert on on YouTube or social media or something like that. And so I think that that's something that's important for the public to recognize as well, that if you do want to become an archaeologist and do archaeology, there's no need for a fancy degree in my mind, but it certainly requires a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that you can just go dabble into and think that you can do everything in archaeology. I certainly can't. My presentation was put together by, you know, talking with more than 20 different colleagues because I don't know the archaeology of the entire world and around where Graham Hancock goes. I got mm. help putting slides together. I got little short cl video clips that I played. I had advice on what articles to read to inform me. I talked with people over Zoom repeatedly for the couple weeks leading up to this to, to get my hand, uh, my hands on the right updated information that would be relevant in the conversation. And so, you know, archaeology is in that sense very collaborative as well. I mean, the, the worst archaeologists are those who think they know everything. What we need to be always doing is constantly learning and collaborating and recognizing the limits of our own, you know, expertise and what we can talk about, if you see what I mean. And so I think that's really important. And that was one of the goals I, I tried to get across by citing everybody on my slides and not wanting to talk about things that I'm not an expert in. But the, in, interesting you talking about language there. It's certainly something I've, I've been very aware of. And obviously you, you were, you were talking about trying to uh, uh, certainly limit the amount of, uh, jargon that you used in the Joe Rogan conversation. Um, yeah. I think inevitably, you know, w w when we have a professional expert, I, I know I do it, but we, we, you know, um, w w when we have a professional involvement in something, we, we do sometimes slip in almost accidentally because we, you know, we know what we mean and we assume that the person we're having the conversation with uh, does also. And, and certainly one of the things I've had to learn doing this kind of work is um, to, I often joke about it, um, calling it talking human. Um, but certainly, uh, if I'm having, uh, uh, and again, I don't know what conversations you had with the, um, for example, the, uh, with, with, with Sapiens and with the um, uh, uh, with the Guardian Stroke Observer about uh, the the way that article was pitched. But um, the la obviously the language we use, even in and of itself, sometimes risks limiting our audience do you think do you think as archaeologists well first of all how, how, you know is, is it something you're conscious of in, in in your work particularly 
as it's become more public but also do you think it's something that should be more of a a, a part of the the training or, uh, uh, of people like your students I definitely think we need to train our students how to be less uh, reliant upon jargon outside of academic articles. Um, within an academic article where you're trying to be as precise as possible, I understand the need for writing in that way. But outside of an academic article, even at an academic conference, you should be lowering the amount of jargon that you use because your audience is not always going to be familiar with your subfield. In this sense, I have a, an advantage, let's say, where my research crosses between two very different subfields, classical Greek archaeology and, and you know, archaeological science, zooarchaeology. And so whenever I give a presentation, you know, from fairly early on in my career, I realize my audience, half of them are going to be people that know classical Greece. The other half are going to be people that know zooarchaeology. But the, the there's there's such a wide divide between those two audiences that I need to just strip everything I'm saying of jargon or else I'm going to lose half the audience on one part of my paper and the other half of the audience I'm on the other part of my paper. And so, you know, when I give advice to students or, or early career scholars giving even academic papers, I would advise to everybody to really get a sense of what jargon is and to get to limit it as much as possible. And especially even when teaching at the undergrad level, we need to do that, especially early on in the term where you're trying to get everybody on the same page. If you overload jargon, technical terms, even place names within the first few sort of class sessions, it's everybody, people are going to come in overwhelmed, um, as students, I mean. And so it's better for us to learn how to communicate effectively without too much jargon, without too much sort of run on sentences and things like that when you're writing for the public. And so it's the kind of things that we're not trained very effectively to do. But I think I, I sort of, I've always encouraged people to write Twitter threads. That gives you a sense of how to write concisely and to use visuals to back it up and to obviously you're going to, it's going to naturally start writing with less jargon if your goal is to talk with the public and to just practice with that. I think it's really important that we all become accustomed with that to understand who our audience is and make sure that what we're trying to say and how we say it is is geared to to hit that audience, you know? It's sort of like where, you know, even in that conversation on a uh, you know, uh, the, the the topic of racism and stuff like that, I wanted to be very careful in how I present myself. And I, you know, I, I, as I think we said off camera, I was very pleased to see Joe Rogan acknowledge um, how Spanish colonization could impact indigenous mythology. And so I, I think that that came across very well because I, I, I worked hard to explain it clearly and I had uh, an indigenous archaeologist, Curly Tlapoyawa, of Tales from Atlantis podcast, record a little clip for me, and 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 Marika Stoll, who works in that area, and they both hit up. They, they they know that area very well, so they're able to explain it very clearly. And uh, I think the combo of those things was very effective. Thinking through how to hit that audience, if you see what I mean, was my my main goal, and I think it should always be our goals when talking to the public. I'm starting to move. Up conversation to a to a conclusion um you've just talked about obviously public facing work um one thing that comes with public facing work uh is something which again traditional academic archaeologists might not feel particularly comfortable with some individuals might not feel particularly comfortable with and that's put uh, to, to quote a colloquial phrase lifting your head above the parapet and Looking at the comments um, under the YouTube feed uh, and, and the Reddit streams and so on, um, as well as the technical issues that you were dealing with, um, there were some borderline ad hominem attacks, some, some over things you're not responsible for, like, for example, who your father was, a <laughs> very eminent uh, archaeologist in his own right. Um, but also things you're not, uh, you, you did have some choice over, like, for example, the 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 hat that you wore um <laughs> and there were some some comments a, a, about that now again I, I, having you know uh i've certainly played to the the indiana trope before zawi hawass has built a career on it um <laughs> other, other colleagues do it as well and, and it's a sort of tongue-in-cheek um response to that to the to the steven spielberg indiana jones tropes but do, did you find any of that hurtful or unexpected or were, were, did you expect it? How, how did you set yourself up to deal with that? No, I actually found those comments to be refreshing because they were very superficial. And, you know, I've had Twitter spats before with Graham Hancock fans or other pseudo-archaeology fans. And sometimes the stuff can get very nasty, um, like, 
you know, just, just extremely nasty. And uh, I'm not going to go into it, but like fairly racist or anti-Semitic and stuff like that. And uh, mm. uh, this was mostly just fairly superficial con comments and like my sleeves because my, my, my shirt did not fit well, which I'll admit was my fault. I should have tested that shirt more in beforehand, but uh, it is what it is. And I, I prefer somebody commenting on my sleeves or my hat or even my dad than to be going deeper and start stalking me or something like that, which I've not seen much of. And so uh, I was very pleased with the mostly positive comments directed at me. My Twitter DMs were 90% positive. People who used to be Graham Hancock fans saying, wow, I, I actually learned a whole lot and I see the problems with what his narrative is. I've, I've gotten thousands of messages from people that were former Graham Hancock fans or just Joe Rogan fans who have made that kind of point. And that's actually what I've seen the most of. And then the critique has been fairly superficial. I actually think, look, some people in the field critique wearing a hat like that. I got my hat in a flea market for a dollar in Santiago, Chile. I like wearing it. I think that for the public, it qu pretty quickly just tells them I'm an archeologist, if you see what I mean, without having to de deal with anything else to prove myself or something like that. Look, I study ancient Greek pottery, for example, and when they depict deities or heroes, each of those heroes or deities has a quick little attribute visually that identifies them. And it's sort of like having a trope. We see this on TV all the time. A nerd is always gonna have on glasses, right? You know, And so that's just how it goes. And so I think that that's, it's, it's easier to play into those tropes and accept them and to therefore just immediately jump into the substance of what we want to talk about rather than something else and you look if people are going to criticize my dad well fuck them my dad was a great dad and a really good archaeologist so you know i could care less i'm going to bring up his research when it's relevant and that's life <laughs> yeah sure look uh, okay um now uh, uh, in terms of where we go next i just like to offer you and and because and, 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 i think obviously you know it, what what you've been a part of i think we as i said at the beginning we we all admit is a significant cultural event in in archaeology um but uh, and and it's part of a a very current discussion about how the sector responds to pseudo archaeology and you know uh, umpteen series of ancient aliens and the curse of Oak, Oak Island and so on rating probably far higher than a lot of what we might call straight archaeology or legit archaeology or whatever however we want traditional archae however however we want to frame it um, I'd just like to read you something you, you alluded in the uh, to to um, to a previous uh, some previous media criticism of Graham Hancock um, mm -hmm. and uh, in the Horizon uh, program, uh, it was alluded to in the in, in the in the Joe Rogan experience. I'd just like to read you something. Um, the program had created the impression that he was an intellectual fraudster who had put forward half baked theories and ideas in bad faith, and that he was incompetent to defend his own arguments. Now, in 1999, the British Broadcasting Standards Commission, uh, to whom Graham Hancock complained in those terms, along with many other complaints. Um, the commission, quote, finds no unfairness to Mr. Hancock in these matters. Um, and in, in, in fact, that, that was a, a complaint about um, a program um, called Atlantis Reborn, mm -hmm. uh, which was covered in the BBC's Horizon Strand, their mainstream science strand, in 1999 in the light of that uh, broadcasting standards commission that regulators adjudication the um they the bbc re-edited the program to take note of some minor criticisms and basically repeated the same criticisms over and over again now that was nearly 25 years ago why do you think you had to put your head above the parapet on the joe rogan experience 25 years later why is it still an issue yeah, I mean, to some degree, uh, it's he never really went away after that. If you see what I mean, he continued publishing top books. He continued. He 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 got in touch with Joe Rogan and went on there several times. I think that his appearances on there really helped him reach uh, new levels of popularity, which eventually led to his TV show, Ancient Apocalypse. And I mean. It was in many ways Ancient Apocalypse that got me thinking about him more clearly because he's actually 
much more polite with archaeologists in his books. He doesn't attack us rigorously or as vigorously, I should say, as he did on Ancient Apocalypse, where it was really just a string of attacks on the profession and the people that uh, that do it. And I think that that's what makes it a conspiracy theory is this, you know, constant belittling and attack, calling us arrogant, calling us patronizing, riling up his fans against those of us that are really just trying to do our jobs, right? We're really just trying to uncover the past, uh, write it up for government reports or for publication in, in scholarly journals, present it to children in museums. This is what we're doing. And he's going on you know, Netflix and talking to millions and saying that we are evil people who try to suppress the truth and things like that. And I think that's where it came from and that the, the sort of social media explosion afterwards, which I was part of, but I, 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 I certainly was not as loud and vociferous as some other people who were very outright calling him racist or things like that. And so it created this very acrimonious kind of social media environment. And so, you know, I, I wanted to go there and try to show what archaeologists actually do who we really are, how we answer these questions, and to try to also at the end, you know, I wanted to highlight the threats that we face um, to funding. I, I, everybody, please look up the petition to fund Welsh cultural heritage here in Wales. Um, there's, we're facing 20% cuts. The National Museum might close. It's uh, a petition for the Senate. And that so it should be read and then discussed um, and maybe we can make it a change. So go sign that. And, you know, to be honest, within two days, three days of the release of Joe Rogan experience episode, that petition received 2000 new signatures. And so it had an impact. And uh, at the same time, I highlighted sort of the closure of different programs. You know, we first started chatting on Twitter over the closure of Sheffield, where uh, which is where I Indeed. learned how to how to study zooarchaeology. And so these are things that I really wanted to get across. And I was really pleased to hear both Graham Hancock and Joe Rogan say they could not understand why uh, archaeology funding is being cut. And they, they actually came out as against it. And I hope that that has an impact by reaching some more powerful people um, who might think otherwise about cutting archaeology. I don't know if it will, but I hope it, even if it just reaches a few powerful people, it can. I want to find that clip and put it on social media, actually, um, because I thought that was really powerful where they both agreed with me on that at the end. Yeah. And yeah. I have, yeah, I, I have to say that that outbreak of agreement that all three of you at the end of the show saying that actually we need archaeologists we need this evidence it, it, it's part of our culture we need to we need to maintain it and take it forward that wasn't on my joe rogan experience graham hancock v flint bingo card <laughs> yeah um, so um no i, I and, and i think it, it it it's probably a, a, a as, as good a note as any on which to to to, to conclude that there are some things that are maybe bigger than just this this one argument. Although this one argument does crystallise a lot of the issues in terms of uh, the, the 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 sector, the archaeological and heritage sector, uh, how it talks to people, how it talks to people outside our sector, how it talks to itself. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I think uh, uh, it really just remains for me to say. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Ben Dibble, for taking the time out to talk to The Watching Brief uh, this afternoon and um, wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Go check me out on YouTube. <laughs> well, we hope you enjoyed the video with Flynn Dibble that you've just watched. And in the course of the video, we reference changes in podcasting and the expectations of audiences and participants, actually, in terms of video and audio and, and so on. We need to keep up with all of those changes and uh, and trends and that takes time and it takes money it takes money to provide our time and it takes money to provide the kit that we use and so on and so on and so on if you enjoyed what you just watched if you think what we do is important please support us on patreon you can do that for as little as a pound a month and you can support the watching brief by buying us buying us a coffee from time to time thank you bye-bye when did what happen 